Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hi, welcome to Oregon Voter Digest. Uh, this is Scott Jorgensen, legislative staffer and author, filling in for Bruce Broussard, as I did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think he thought I did all right, so I said, hey, why don't you come back and do it again? And I said, well, I mean, I'll miss the second half of the Seahawks game, but I'll be taping that anyway. So uh, based on what I've seen so far this season, I'm not missing much. Joining me today for the first half of the program is Bob Niedermeyer, and he is running for the Republican nomination for Oregon governor. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us, Mr. Good Niemeyer. Good afternoon. So tell us a little bit about your background, education, and experience. Okay, hey, I'm... Uh I'm an independent mechanical engineer. I do product development. Though if somebody comes to me with an idea for a product, I can help develop it into a pro uh, and coordinate the manufacturing, do the CAD prototyping, everything is necessary to actually put a product out on the uh, marketplace. So you've actually done quite a bit of that over the years and obtained since, patents. Since 1988, yes. I've got over uh, 30 patents to my name. A few of them I actually own, too. <laughs> So you've been able to do that for a while, so you understand business from that perspective and that end of it, what it takes to actually take an idea and develop it into a workable product and then oh, yes. get it to market and all yes. that. And I've had several people literally have come to me with their entire life savings and want to put it into a product to try and improve their own lives by putting a product onto the marketplace or starting a business. So it's, it's sometimes it's rather uh, uh, an awesome responsibility when you know that's all that they have. And you have to be careful with what they do. So you're a native Oregonian? Yes. Grew up in Silverton. And uh, you did high school in the area? Yeah, yeah, in Silverton High School. I graduated there and then I went to Oregon State University and got a BS in mechanical engineering. And then. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I had to live in California for a few years, and that's where I got my professional engineering license. And it was uh, transferable up to Port, or, or into Oregon. And now you live in Washington County? Yes, in Tigard. Tigard resident. Very well. Yeah, um, my, my company is called New Ventures Engineering. What inspired you to run for governor? I mean, it isn't something you woke up one day and said, gee, I know, I'm, I'm going to run for governor. Or, or did well, you? The the. It really goes back two years. I decided to run for Congress two years ago. And the reason I did that had a lot to do with a, a number of things about how Congress was really ignoring all the people in the United States and doing so many things that, that needed to be corrected. So I thought the best way to do it was to go ahead and, and run for Congress. And that was in the first congressional district? The, right? Yes, against Susan Bonamici. And then you know, as things progressed, it became real obvious that even if I had won, there was virtually nothing I can do uh, to straighten out Congress and how they act. So I decided that the best thing to do was was come back and maybe run for an office in uh, in Oregon. And I chose to go for governor for two reasons, and it has to do mostly with uh, the possibility that there could be another 16 governors, Republican governors, elected. Uh, this go around, which puts us well over the limit necessary for us to perhaps have the governor's call a uh, state's convention for the Article 5, uh, which is written into the United States Constitution that would allow us to do an amendment or two uh, for such things as term limits. Because there's no way, for instance, Congress is going to allow an amendment to uh, term limit their jobs. It's just not going to happen. If I remember but the right, states can do it. When they had the contract with America in the mid-90s, they were yes. able to get through most of that agenda. I think that was the one thing that they didn't get to, right, was term limits for themselves. They, they did all these true. other things well, they actually, wanted to do, and they, they got to that and said, well, I don't know, I like my job. I like being a congressman. Yeah, well, I, I believe they actually did do something, but it was slapped back by the hmm. uh, Supreme Court almost instantaneously before anybody could, could do anything about it. And the Supreme Court basically said it's got to be in the Constitution in order for that to be in effect. So we might want to take another run at that, though. So that, that's one yes. of the reasons that you're running. Yes, um, and, 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 and you know, I also you know, had created this Declaration of Independence, which I do have a version that I'm writing for the state of Oregon. But 
along with that declaration was uh, three or four constitutional amendments. And one of the, the pet things of mine is to turn the uh, legislature and the appointed people that are in the federal government into uh, contractors. Basically, I'm a contractor. People pay me just money to do a job. And I think that's what we need to do with Congress, is set them up so that they can only receive money, they only get uh, just, just cash. They are responsible for everything, like their own retirement, their own benefits, their own everything. And that would basically force them to become part of the people again. And I'd like to see us do the same thing in the state of Oregon. Well, yeah, and with Congress, I always thought that these guys should make the median income in their districts and try to live off of that uh, and actually, see how quickly things would change if that were the case. Like, yeah. oh my God, it's impossible to make a living off of this. Say, well, yeah. good, now, now you feel our pain, truly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I tend to believe that they should be paid, or Congress anyways, they should be paid quite a bit more than they are now if they don't get anything else and they have to pay for their own staff their own insurance, their own everything coming out of their own pocket so they can actually see the money where it has to go rather than somebody else doing it for them. So what was your big takeaway from your congressional race in 2014? If I remember right, that was the first time you'd run for anything. Right? Yes. You're just a regular guy making a living and then... Well, say, yes. Uh, speaking of regular guy, you know, I, I really am an outsider all of this. And I'm hoping that uh, that's going to um, help quite a bit because I look at some of the stuff going on from an outside point of view and I'm just absolutely amazed at the stuff I ran into. The stuff that I ran into for running for Congress and the, the litany of things that's going on in this state that a lot of people don't know about. It's, it's uh, almost amazing to me. Let's talk about that, what some of your key issues are running for governor and what a Bob Niemeyer administration would look like? Well, the latest thing that, that seems to be on everybody's mind is this administrative law. How did that come about? Where did it actually come from? Or why does the, the legislature or even the governor think that this is a good way to run a government? It isn't. Uh, I look at it more as, as the uh, several areas within government being just plain lazy uh, where the legislature probably couldn't get something passed they just pawned it off to somebody they appointed to make their decisions and it, it's beginning to show some patterns in that uh, several of those uh, positions that have been created and several of the, the power struggles that we've seen like for instance the sweet cakes uh, affair where they just took the Klein's property just a few days ago uh, basically, I see that, that what they did was combine uh, lawmaking with law enforcement or the legislature with the uh, executive branch of government into one position. And they did that in a way that they could get around a lot of the legislative process that exists. I think I'm that's, uh, you know, formulating that opinion right now. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to publish something here real soon about that. But I actually think that that's what's really going on. That's what they tried to get away with. Well, I think they tried to pass a couple of bills this last legislative session to expand the Labor Commissioner's authority. And mm -hmm. one of them would have enabled the Labor Commissioner, because right now, if there's a dispute, it has to go to court, right, um, in order to receive a cease and desist order yeah. against a business. And the bill, which was very controversial, they it replaced the courts with labor commissioner repeatedly in statute exactly. so that instead of exactly. the labor commissioner and the Bureau of Labor and Industries putting together a case, presenting it to a judge and saying, here's why we think that, that this is necessary, they just bypassed the courts entirely. Correct. And that bill actually reached the House floor a couple of times got sent back to committee because they didn't have the votes for it. That was an instance of 
the business lobby and small business owners all over the state being up in arms was, and saying, hey, what are you that doing? That was a, a definitely an instance of judge, jury, and executioner all rolled into one. And they wanted another one that was similar that would enable, that would have enabled them to place liens against the personal property of business owners based on the allegations of wrongdoing. Correct. I read that one just a few days ago, and that was... Now, luckily, we killed that bill. I don't even think it got out of committee, but partly no. because some of us made such a, a big stink about it. Yes. Uh, and the, the business community responded in kind, and I'm glad they did. So that's one of the issues. It, it's interesting about administrative rules because we did a newsletter about that uh, for my office a while ago. And we started off by saying, well, how many are there? So we asked the state archivist hey, state archivist, one person in the state who's supposed to keep track of this, the one person who should know this, how many administrative rules are there? And, and her first response was, well, I don't know, I'm going to have to get back to you. And what she did was put together an estimate. So she did kind of a sampling for some of the agencies and the number of rules they have, and we averaged it out per business day, and it turns out that there's a new administrative rule something like every 15 minutes. So it's something that's just over here growing and festering and that nobody seems to be keeping track of. I'm glad you use the term fester. <laughs> well, it would come up quite often. I used to work for the House Republican office and we'd be in caucus meetings and some of the members would get frustrated and they'd say, why are we having to pass rules to tell these agencies to do things that they should be doing anyway? Correct. And conversely, why are we passing laws to tell them to not do things that they're not supposed to be doing? Yes. So and you want to get your arms around all that. Correct. Why aren't those positions basically turned into things such as what I've been calling a cabinet level position within the, the government working for the governor? And the, the reason I'm still trying to formulate a few things in my head here is can the Labor Commission actually override the governor or can the governor say no to some of this stuff? Oh, because the Labor Commissioner is another elected official. Correct. That's Who is actually in charge? Is the governor actually the, the highest authority in this state? My guess is that they're trying to convince or create positions around the outside of the governor that over that may have a higher authority. Now, I'll track those things down and stop them immediately. What are some of your other key issues if elected governor? No carbon tax, period. There, there's no excuse for having a carbon tax. And I'm an engineer, and I deal with reality all the time. And the, I mean, if, if I design something like a re refrigerator, people are going to expect that refrigerator to work. If I design a car and it's supposed to work off of fuel that has carbon in it, people are going to expect it to work, and they're supposed to get a good, decent mileage and things like that. Well, this carbon tax is over and outside of whatever uh, is is justified in a tax. I mean, where's that money going to go? Uh, it it does not belong. Uh, it's going to go to some places. Actually, I'm kind of afraid that there might be an effort to try and shovel money off to some uh, world organization who wants to own the uh, atmosphere or something like that is their own idea of how to control uh, fossil fuel use. I, I just will do anything I can to prevent that. But I, I really think that they're looking at the carbon tax as just another way of getting more money into the government that doesn't get spent on the roads. Yeah, and actually uh, probably the most controversial bill passed during the 2015 session was one that extended the sunset on low carbon fuel standards. Yes. And what was interesting is that we're still trying to wrap our heads around the modeling and the basis in reality, as you mentioned. And what's interesting is that they're starting off by saying, okay, here's Oregon's total carbon output. And so you ask these state agency folks, so how much of that is uh, from catastrophic wildfires? They say, yeah. well, none, we didn't include that. So, then That's your model is not, not going right. to work. It's inaccurate because uh, this last summer, especially all over the state, especially rural Oregon, in Southern Oregon, you couldn't even see the nearby hillsides for correct. weeks because of all the smoke, which is carbon <laughs> being yes, released into the atmosphere. But somehow that's not included in the model. So it, me driving that, to work is bad for the environment, but half of the state burning that is carbon neutral? Right. I mean, it, we have you have to start with the sound basis in reality, and it doesn't seem to me that they're doing that. No, they they're not. 
I, I, reality is completely ignored when it comes to carbon. So you would repeal that bill? I'd also try and get rid of oxygenated fuels. I don't believe that oxygenated fuels uh, exist for the purpose of, you know, saving the environment at all. Because all it does is basically decrease your mileage uh, and it causes the state to make more money per gallon of gasoline. It, it has nothing to do with the environment. It has to do with making more money on taxes. All right. So if, if elected, you would would you repeal Senate Bill 324, the low carbon fuel standard bill? I, as fast as I can. Excellent. No, and, I'm glad. And I would also try and push for not having oxygenated fuels any longer. What about the biofuel mandates? And I'll bring this up because we took a run at this this last session. You know, my boss's district is very rural. It's a large part of Central Oregon, covers five different counties. And he got complaints from people in the district that during the winter time, when temperatures drop below zero, that their machinery doesn't work because Correct. of this biofuel that it coagulates, it gels, and they're worried that you're going to have situations where you have school children, you know, busfuls of school children in the middle of nowhere in freezing temperatures, yes. and the bus isn't going to work because of this. And we had a hearing on the bill, and a lobbyist from the environmental group and uh, a biofuels industry lobbyist were there. Oh, gee, well, we've never heard of any problems with this whatsoever. We had pictures of a fuel filter covered it in goop, in goop. right? So uh, you'd be a little more flexible about that in your administration. The, the, what needs to be challenged for biofuels, particularly diesel, is how much oil products are consumed to manufacture it. I think that when you actually find out how much oil is actually burnt to manufacture the stuff that they're claiming is better for the environment, that you find it's a significant amount of oil that's consumed just to produce a biofuel. No excuse for that. Well, Somebody I has to look at the big picture and be honest about how much is actually being really saved uh, oil-wise by doing that. Well, yeah, and they've started calculating an indirect land use portion of, of what it takes because, for example, if you're using sugar cane or if you're using corn as fuel instead of food, which I think is just dumb anyway, um, then, then you do have an indirect land use impact on that. Yes. A and that hasn't been calculated up until now. Well, another thing you'd really need to look at is, is okay, how much corn can be grown in the United States, and then compare that to how much diesel fuel is actually being consumed in the United States. We can't produce enough corn to produce well, even the alcohol that is going into the uh, oxygenated fuels. It, it, there isn't enough corn any place to do that, so they have to take oil products half burnt the things to generate oxygenated parts of the fuel and and put it into the uh, gasoline that's not no that that's that's an incredible waste of, of oil just for the sake of you know having your way uh, for oxygenated fuels or the biofuels so one of the things that was discussed this last <clears throat> session and we got really close on was a comprehensive statewide transportation package is that the kind of thing you would support? Probably not if it has anything to do with uh, light rail and part of it. Totally against light rail. There's some areas in Oregon where it's probably been a little bit successful. The cost of operating the thing and the cost of the ticket don't even come close to being identical. So, I, and I you know, don't believe that people should be forced to ride a system going from, let's just say, uh, Lake Oswego into downtown Portland when all those businesses could have been out in Lake Oswego. Why make them commute? During the upcoming 2017 uh, legislative session, it's going to be painful, to say the least. And maybe I'll still be a staffer, maybe I won't, we'll see. Maybe my boss just filed for re-election, so... Well, unless you're being paid $5 billion a year. <laughs> That's where I'm going with this, because we're going to have to come up with all kinds of money, seemingly. Yes. Um, hers is going to need to be shored up. 
the ODOT budget is about to go sailing off the cliff and we're already hearing this pressure for more tax increases uh, yes. while they're pushing for a higher minimum wage and things like that. So, yeah. And then there's the possibility of Oracle suing uh, Oregon for uh, about 2.1 billion is what I think. And the feds might want some of their money back. And that's the other thing, Oregon Health Authority's budget's gonna be in bad shape because we're gonna have to start contributing towards some of that, mm -hmm. uh, the Medicaid expansion that the feds have covered up until now. So what is your plan to come up with the several billion dollars that it looks like we're going to need? Uh, I think that we're going to have to seriously look at where Oregon is spending its money and find ways to, to chop back on a lot of things that I believe are being extremely wasteful. I find it really hard to believe that the budget estimate is $69 billion for a, well, a state that only has 4 million people in it. Uh, $11 billion is just for uh, administrative costs. I mean, that's a huge number of employees. And what are they really doing other than coming up with more administrative laws? Uh, something has to be done in terms of, of these excess uh, entities that exist. Uh, like what entity is there, for instance, that's actually doing the urban growth boundary uh, limits? Uh, who's paying them? Is that coming out of the state? Uh, why is it that they have, think they have the authority to reach clear out to boring, for instance, to control their land use. There there's, there seems to be several entities that, that could be chopped out of uh, existence really fast. To, so you would go more, you take the approach of more of where can we cut spending as opposed to immediately going towards, oh, we need six billion dollars in additional taxes. Yes. Okay. Yes, I, I believe cutting spending is, uh, is what needs to be done. And, and to be honest with you, I really do believe that uh, uh, a large portion of the money that's in PERS is gone. I do not believe that there is $69 billion in the PERS uh, coffers. They wouldn't be asking for as much money as they want if it, if it was really all there, because they should be able to make even at 1% enough to pay off the, the yearly uh, amount of money that they're spending. So something is really not right there. And I remember two years ago, um, Dennis Richardson actually challenged that and tried to get some genuine information out of it. And he got this song and dance and basically this thing that said they were making 7% on investments two years ago. Nobody's making 7%. Nobody <laughs> is, no. Uh, the, the best that anybody could do right now is buy a 30-year T-bill at 3.5%. Uh, nobody's going to do that, uh, not with... Uh, conditions the way they are now in the market. So you would try to shore up the state's overall financial picture as a priority? Yes. Yes. Something has to be done. Something has to get organized. In fact, I would actually think that maybe challenging Oracle to maybe try and get something for the $2.1 billion we're supposed to make is to have them put together a system where the legislature and the governor can actually see the money on a screen or a spreadsheet and see where it's actually going. <laughs> That'd be an interesting approach to a settlement there. Yes. <laughs> I, I can imagine Oracle would sit back and say, oh yeah, you want us to expose everybody in the Oregon government? <laughs> we'll, we'll do that for a billion less. <laughs> so at this point, there are two officially filed candidates, and they're both on the Republican side. And come, Governor Kate Brown has indicated that she's running, but I don't think she's done anything official yet. Well, there was somebody, I, I didn't catch the name yet, but somebody from Southern Oregon jumped in the Democratic side. That's right. It was a, a doctor from Ashland, if I remember yes. right. So what is your path to victory, uh, first of all, through the Republican primary? I know I've been running into you a lot. Yes. at different events and functions throughout, so, so that's a good start. Yes, yeah, I have been going around to a number of places and getting a lot of input from people. I'm trying to listen more than, than talk. Uh, I have an incredible pile of information that I'm using to turn into that Declaration of Independence for Oregon, which is really nothing more than a list of things that you don't want the government to do anymore. 
Uh, oh, and one of those happens to be no GPS tracking on cars. The, the vehicle mileage tax proposal, it, and it starts off as a pilot program, except no, it wouldn't take it much for them to say it's no, no longer just, voluntary. Just, correct. It, it's guaranteed that that will happen. So we have to, to stop that completely right up, up front. But I think that, that what I'm formulating in my mind anyways is that this, the fact that I'm an outsider looking in at this stuff and pointing out several of the deficiencies in our government uh, would be a, a very good approach to the campaign. And I'm glad I started when I did uh, back in, in July so I could get some more listening under my belt to, to start formulating some of these uh, answers to uh, how to fix some of the problems. So if I remember right, when you did your congressional bid a couple of years ago, you got into the race kind of late. Well, yeah, two days early. What made me jump into that race uh, really was an EBT card sign accepted here. I, I went to Papa Murphy's Pizza, and I, you know, saw the EBT card welcome here, and then I went over and bought gas at the 76 station, and they had the same uh, thing in the window there. So they were taking EBT cards at a gas station to buy junk food inside. Uh, that's not right. I mean, there's my tax dollars buying them uh, coffee and and uh, uh, pepperoni sticks. It just really bothered me. So I, I decided to run for Congress. <laughs> right before the deadline. Right before the deadline, right. I didn't even have enough time to try and collect signatures. Uh, and uh, several of the speeches that I gave, I still got 17% of the vote. And I didn't get my... Um, into the voters pamphlet it was strictly oh that's awesome. huge too yeah i got 17 percent without being in the voters pamphlet so if somebody wanted to know more about the campaign or become involved or volunteer how could they do that bobneemeyer.com and that's uh, b-o-b-n-i-e-m-e-y-e-r.com all right and we have a, a place to of course donate uh and uh, a place that we can actually accept uh, information about volunteers well, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, for well, those thank of you, you very much for having me. For those of you just tuning in, this is Oregon Voter Digest. This is Scott Jorgensen, legislative staffer and author, filling in for Bruce Broussard. My guest for the first half of the show is Bob Niemeyer, who's running for the Republican nomination for Oregon governor. We're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we will be joined by Richard Burke. He's the executive director of the Western Liberty Network. So he'll tell you all about that organization and what they do. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. They're extinct. They're... Welcome back to Oregon Voters Digest. Uh, this is Scott Jorgensen, legislative staffer and author, filling in for your usual host, my friend Bruce Broussard. Joining me for the first half of the show was Bob Niemeyer, a uh, Republican candidate for governor. And joining me for the second half is my friend Richard Burke, who is executive director of the Western Liberty Network. Well, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you for having me on the show. So what is Western Liberty Network and what do you do? 
Western Liberty Network is a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan, tax exempt organization. It's an educational foundation, and what we do is we train grassroots activists how to be more impactful in their communities, how to take responsibility, and essentially take charge of the places where they live. So you were in Tacoma, Washington yesterday. That's right. What what on earth were you doing in Tacoma? <laughs> well, sitting uh, in traffic. I heard that happens a lot over there. Did sit in traffic for a while, but finally was able to get there. And uh, I had a training toward the end of the day. And what I did is I went over how board and staff governance works, which a lot of people need to know if they're going to monitor public boards or if they're going to serve on one. Also, how the local budget process works. The laws are a little different in Washington than in Oregon. So I went over the, the Washington laws. Also, how ethics laws work. If you're going to monitor a board as a grassroots activist, or if you're going to serve on a board, you need to make sure that you don't accidentally violate ethics laws. They're, it's really easy to run afoul of them. A lot of times, if you go to a vendor function and you are standing up at a maybe a bar table, it doesn't qualify as a reportable meal, but if you sit down in a chair and eat it, it qualifies as a reportable meal. I mean, there are a lot of ways to go wrong with eth ethics laws, and people need to know how to avoid and detect violations. Uh, we also taught them uh, a little bit about how you can be a appointed or elected local office holder and leverage that into becoming a local opinion leader and affect politics in your community. Just a lot of skills like that. What I really try to do is build cadres of people who want to run for local nonpartisan office. We've trained about 250 candidates over the last two cycles, and about 200 of them have gotten elected to offices from school boards, mosquito control boards, soil and water conservation district, all of those sorts of things. Uh, if they don't want to be a candidate, we train them how to be a campaign manager. If they don't want to be a campaign manager, we train them how to be a good campaign volunteer. And so at different times in the election cycle, we emphasize different things. And we also hold annual leadership conferences and youth conferences. So there's, there's a lot of offerings, and uh, we have to be very careful. Western Liberty Network will never support or oppose a candidate or a legislative position or a ballot measure position by, future, by virtue of our 501c3 status. But we do train people how to be effective in their communities. What they do with the training then is up to them. And that gets back to, you know, there's a saying, all politics is local. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about a lot of the different positions. It, it, these are oftentimes the things that people, they get on their ballot and they say, soil and water conservation district. That's and right. it, you're not talking about highly contested races where people are going to be spending lots of money. A lot of times people run uncontested, if I remember right. Yep, but but these things actually uh, play a very big role in local government. I'm taking uh, public administration courses right now uh, over at Portland State, so I can get a master's. Mm -hmm. uh, because and then people say face the master. <laughs> because apparently a, a BS in journalism only gets you so far in life. <laughs> but they said that there's somewhere between eighty-five and ninety thousand special districts in the United States. There are a lot of them, and you have to have people to fill those positions and mm -hmm. so that's one of the roles you guys fill is taking somebody who is, is curious about the process who says look I'm concerned about my country not really sure where to start and you say okay well here's some training you can start at the very local level be on your soil and water conservation district board yeah, we have a political culture in this state and in, in this country and a lot of people don't like what I like to call the fabric of our political culture and if we want to change the fabric of our political culture in any kind of an enduring way, we have to do it from the bottom up. It's not always exciting. It's not always sexy. It's not always the kind of thing that gets you on Channel 2 News or, or whatever you know, you're watching. But this is what makes the nuts and bolts of our governance, people who serve on these local boards. A lot of times, the local boards are what impact daily lives the most. And if like you mosquito control, that's a big deal towards the end of the summer, depending on where you are. It's a big deal. Right? Vector control boards. Yeah. Uh, it even goes down lower than that. There are cemetery control boards. There are bo boards that are in charge of the maintenance of 
particular roads. Sand control boards. There was a bill that came up this last session that had yep. to do with that. It was mm -hmm. one of the coastal communities wanted to form a, a sand control district. So it's really, oh, oh, okay. Yep, and if, if you run people for these local positions over time, you will have a better chance of bringing about enduring change. Some of the people who get elected to these local offices will serve a term or two then drop out. A lot of them will serve and stay there or get elected to a similar term. But some will realize that they have some talent and they'll rise. And that has actually already started to happen. Representative Nearman. That's a good segue because in my notes here I had success yep. stories and I was going right to that. So Representative Mike Nearman from uh, Polk County. Yep. Uh, started off as just a regular guy, yep. like, like we all do. He got his first exposure to politics at our 2011 leadership meeting. And that was in Medford, if I remember right. He went all the way down to Medford for that one. That's right. And uh, Linda Hamilton was just elected to the Lane County ESD board, which is tough in Lane County. Two got elected at Douglas County ESD. Um, two WLN graduates have now been elected to the Hillsborough School Board. They're starting to make their presence known. And over time, you just feed people into the system. I don't even recruit these candidates. What happens is we, we access activists by going to existing grassroots organizations and offering free training. And we say to them, look, if there's people in your group that you think would be good, tap them on the shoulder, get them to run. We'll provide the training. And anyone can take the training. If you're a Pacific Green Party member, you can take the training. It's not for limited government people. Generally, liberals don't take our training because uh, the the big government movement already has a lot of venues. I was going to say, I mean, they've of. got quite a machine worked up already. Yeah, they don't need us. They can, they're welcome to come, but they don't really need us. But the limited government advocates do. And so they come and they get these skills. And generally, uh, when, when they deploy these skills, they, they do very well. Um, I was going to ask you about the event that you have coming up January 30th. Mm -hmm. now, w when I ask some of these questions, uh, folks, I'm playing dumb because the <coughs> fact of the matter is that I've known Richard for a long time and I've actually participated in some of these conferences and teach classes and everything. So the one that we did last January actually coincided with my wife's birthday. So we had a good yeah, time. Yeah, have you been have you been forgiven for that yet? <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to ask her what I get home. Uh, you've got another one coming up this January 30th. January 29th and 30th. It will be our fifth annual leadership and activist training conference. And what we usually do on Friday night is we have a reception with live music, hot appetizers. It's a good chance to get to know people, to network, and we usually have a wonderful time. You know, you've been to a couple of those. And then Saturday is the full conference. We're going to have two candidate debates one during the morning assembly, one during the lunch assembly. And uh, in between those candidate debates, we'll have 20 breakout sessions on four tracks of instruction that activists can take. The whole day, including a lunch, will be $50. And uh, these have been great successes. And I expect this one to be the best one yet. And do we have a venue worked out for that one? In contract negotiations right now. I think it's going to be in Wilsonville. Oh, that'd be very convenient. It'd be very convenient. You wouldn't even have to put me up for the night. That's Just right. Go home afterwards as soon as it's done. Yes. Well, it depends on how much you party the night before. And that's a good segue. Uh, you mentioned earlier the youth conference. Yes. Uh, this last youth conference happened to coincide with my birthday, as it is, and my 35th. I just seem to be messing with your personal life. Sorry Enhancing it in many respects. So that was <laughs> that was in Eugene, yep. and that was the youth conference, and uh, the theme of it was passing the torch. That's right. And actually, I got to give some of the closing remarks and included that in my new book, by the mm -hmm. way, On the Cusp of Chaos, available oh, cool. on Amazon.com. On the Cusp of Chaos. On the Cusp of Chaos. Amazon.com. It's an entire chapter called uh, Be the Hero because that was kind of the theme. And I, I've seen a lot of that. My first book, Transition, was about a lot of the young leaders that I see sure. emerging. Sure. And uh, I even have these kinds of conversations fairly regularly now. Um, you know, when, when I was with the caucus, it's always this conventional wisdom thing that the caucus usually wants to have a pretty big say in controlling candidates and who runs for what office. It's nice to have wishes. Right. Yeah. Well, exactly. And anymore, I'm to the point to have where dreams I say wishes, yes. people who want to run should run and they shouldn't have to ask permission from anybody no. to do it. And so this is all part of that process. They do in Russia. You know, they... But not here. But not and here. To me, I think yeah. if you have the passion and you want to run, 
then Godspeed. Mm -hmm. you know, go out and get them. Uh, so I imagine we're going to have another May conference, youth conference coming up. We do, a con we do a, a leadership conference every January. It's always on the Saturday of Pro Bowl weekend. If I vary from that too much, either run into Lincoln Day dinners or a Super Bowl or something. But that's a good little holiday. And I'm not missing the Super Bowl out. for the conference. That's, that's, that's right. <laughs> and then every May we hold a youth conference. And uh, between those times, we train people in particular skills. I spend a lot of time on the road. Sometimes I have help from volunteers. So when I refer to Western Liberty Network in terms of we, the we includes myself and the volunteers that I work with. Uh, you mean guys like me who teach the classes? Exactly. Yeah. You're part of that we, and an important part. You know, you've been great at those events. Okay. And uh, it's a lot of fun to do this work. You meet a lot of people. Uh, you know, I, I oftentimes use that famous quote by Benjamin Franklin. When coming out of the Constitutional Hall, he was asked if we had a republic or a monarchy. And he said, we have a republic if we can keep it. This is an individual challenge to all of us to take responsibility for our own governance. We're supposed to be a self-governing society. If we can't be, and we're unwilling to take responsibility for our own governance, we might as well put the Union Jack back up. Now, folks on the left, I've got to give, give them credit. They've stepped up. A lot of them run for these local nonpartisan positions. And then when there's an opening higher up, they say, well, who can we get to run for that? And they'll say, oh, this person was a county That's commissioner. Five, five years board This person experience. was on a school board. And these people all have networks of supporters and donors and volunteers, and they're able to run. And it looks good on paper, too. Yep. I'm a libertarian for full disclosure, but if there's a limited government person, you know, if there's a position that opens up and the limited government movement is looking for somebody to run, you know, who do they have? A lot of times they'll run somebody who has had a business, maybe been successful, but no experience in government. You know, Rob Cornelis was an example of that. Monica Webby was an example of that. They uh, are great people, and had they won, they, they may have served very well, but they're starting at a deficit. They don't know how the system works. They haven't done it before. They don't have networks of supporters and donors. They've got to start from Well, Monica zero. had some donors. Yeah, Monica had some donors. That's right. And she had some pretty good ones. And, and uh, I, hope, I hope that she doesn't disengage from uh, public policy. But, uh, you know, whether you're a libertarian or whether you're a Republican, you've got to get your feet wet. You've got to, you know, try to get appointed to some office or elected to some office and learn how it really works and have an impact. There are over 7,000 elected local nonpartisan positions in the state of Oregon and another 7,000 appointed positions, budget committee positions, advisory yeah. committee positions. And that's important work too, the budget commission. Mm -hmm. And I've, you know, in my years in the press, I covered many a budget committee meeting and it's about as interesting as it sounds. Yeah. And then you also have the same thing for the county and then you have for the school board. In fact, every May was budget season mm -hmm. where I'd spend many evenings uh, going to the school board budget meetings and the county budget meetings yeah. and crunching through budget documents that are this thick. It's not somebody always has exciting. to sit on those boards. Yeah, somebody has to do it. I mean, it's not always exciting, but sometimes it is. When you get into it, you start to see how things work and you start to see how different political forces move, try to capture the center or move against each other. And you see this manifest in budget documents and other kinds of documents much the way that uh, people who are physicists use mathematics to infer certain things about the universe. You can look at a budget document and infer things about, you know, political motivations and the direction of an organization. And when you're able to, when you're able to see it at that point, all the boring stuff starts to be really interesting. And then you can really look forward and shape the future of your local area. The thing about budgeting, though, is that if you're going to get involved in the budget process, you've got to get involved early. So many people, they show up on the night the budget's going to be adopted, and by then, it's set in cement. It's too late. You've got to get involved early. Now, what inspired your involvement politically? Uh, if I remember right, you were a, a Senate staffer the same as I am now, right. uh, but, but many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, how far back does, does this go for you? Boy Scouts. Really? Yeah. I, I imagine that was a while ago. It was a while ago. <laughs> I, I came up through Cub Scouts when I was seven years old. 
and I went up through the ranks. Uh, I tied I never a world made it record. Past Boy Scouts <laughs> or Cub Scouts. I never made it past Cub Scouts. I got my eagle when I was 13, which what? tied a record at the time. And uh, I, I really just jazzed on it. I loved it. And a couple of the merit badges I earned along the way. Citizenship in the nation, citizenship in the world, citizenship in the community. That got me started. For citizenship in the community, I had to attend some local meetings. Uh, citizenship in the world, I got to talk with a former United Nations ambassador who was my merit badge counselor there. Citizenship in the nation, I got to meet some other folks. And uh, that's where I started to study our founding documents. And that's where I really got the bug. And I started to get into... As a teenager. Uh, it was years early, old. Earlier than that. And, and wow. then I got on student governments and, you know, did all of that nonsense and uh, learned how things work and continued in college. And I really got active in politics beyond campus politics when I was in college at the University of Nebraska. They were tearing down some buildings on a block that... Uh, had businesses that hired a lot of students and those jobs were going, going to go away and that's why I got involved in that. And uh, from then on I just continued to move forward in politics and got involved with the Libertarian Party and land use groups and worked for the legislature and uh, worked for Americans for Prosperity before I was with Western Liberty Network. And that, that's where my, I ran for governor as a uh, Libertarian candidate in 1998. Got elected to a couple of local school committees and now I'm a commissioner on the Tualatin Valley Water District Board of Commissioners, so I've been around the loop a few times. I was just about to go there, too. So that's another one of those kinds of positions. Water commissioner. Mm -hmm. People don't think much of it. Uh, it's not something you worry about day to day. But you know, I've got some water here, and yeah. I'm glad that that but a lot goes into making that happen. Yeah, well, that's true. And water... Water is life. Water is your future. If you do not control your water, you do not control your community's destiny. You cannot attract you know, businesses, jobs, unless you can offer them water. Uh, one of our biggest corporate customers is Intel. They use a lot of water in their chip, their chip fabrication processes. Research Fine Foods is another one. And of course, there are a quarter million residents that depend on Tualatin Valley water for right just everyday needs and this this is all very important and if if another entity controls your water supply then they in effect control your future and when you start to look at it that way water starts to become pretty interesting now how long have you been a, a water commissioner a long time since 1999 and you just got elected to another term i got elected to another term and uh, i've always had opposition and uh, I, i've never run unopposed uh, the closest I ever came to running on a post was in 1993. I ran for a local school committee uh, in the Beaverton School District. And in that case, they found out I was a libertarian who opposed the sales tax, which had been on the ballot well, uh, the year in, before. In all fairness, Oregonians have pretty consistently opposed the sales tax they have. for a long time. But they didn't like what I said about it, so they ran a write-in campaign against me. And the, and the write-in campaign work. got 25% of the vote, you know. <laughs> But except for that, I've always had at least one candidate running against me. And that's good. It keeps you sharp and it keeps you accountable and, and uh, gives you reasons to, uh, additional reasons to get involved and, and talk with people and shake hands. So in a way, Western Liberty Network is your way of paying it forward to the next generation of activists. Partly. I, I've, I've found it to be very rewarding work, but I've also learned that it is indispensable for the proper governance of our local communities and also for developing talent. Uh, with respect to finding qualified people to serve in higher office. You got quite an age range, too, if I remember right, because I've gone to a few of these conferences now, and I see everyone from folks just barely old enough to vote mm -hmm. to people clear on the other end who are established and retired and mm -hmm. uh, kind of looking at it as more of a hobby and a way to get back to the community after all these decades. It is a big age range. Uh, there's one guy that took training, Kyle Knight. He was elected to a school board in Baker City at age 18. And he uncovered some petty financial corruption there and exposed it and that created a bit of a snafu for about a year but things got straightened out and of course there are folks you know across the spectrum as as you know that attend our conferences and take the training and oftentimes apply the training that's wonderful and in the end you get better governance so that's the whole that's idea the idea there. it's it's um it's developing cadres of people who are willing to take charge of the future 
sort of a incidental farm team. You know, Western Liberty Network does not recruit people to run for office. You know, people in their own communities find people they want to support. We just offer the training. And we also train in other areas when it's not, like we just had our local elections in May, and there will be a few in November, but generally the local elections are over until 2017. So let's train on some other skills. How do you properly gather signatures on initiative petition sheets? How do you campaign for the candidates of your choice with little or no money? How do you testify in front of a board? How do you how deal do you, with the news media? How do you deal with the news I've media? I've taught that class. At yes, yes, you have. And you've done <laughs> a say, fine job. Turn their calls and don't lie to them. Yes. That's usually a good a start right That's there. That's a good start. Yeah, sure. But it's a, whole, it's a whole toolbox of, of different tools that people can take out as they wish. As, the, you know, as they acquire different skills, each skill is like a different tool in their toolbox. So Western Liberty Network is about giving people the tools they need to be successful in their communities as they engage in their local democratic processes. What they do with those tools is up to them. That was one of your more recent trainings here locally. All right, so the most recent one was in Tacoma, and that was literally yesterday. But before that, you had a training for some of those folks who did get elected this last May. But yeah, um, that was that we have. I've had a couple of those. I did one in Milton Freewater for folks in Pendleton, Legrand. Uh, we had a number of recently elected office holders come to that. Uh, Walla Walla, Washington. Some people came down from Walla Walla. There's an affiliate, a Western Liberty Network fi affiliate there. Uh, before that, we did a training in Tualatin you know, at the McCormick and Schmicks, and I travel around to the regular meetings of these local groups and provide on-site I was in uh, the Douglas County, I was at the Douglas County Tea Party and trained on how to testify in front of public officials. That's in important. Front of about 40 people down in uh, Sutherland. It was, uh, so I'm, I'm pretty much all over the state and uh, now getting up into Washington State. What are some of the other organizations that you work with? I partner with organizations from time to time. Uh, right now I'm partnering with the Freedom Foundation. I've got some data, they've got some data, and we're trying to put together a comprehensive database of all local elected office holders in both Oregon and Washington. And uh, a number of groups have co-sponsored. Uh, Young Americans for Liberty have are among those organizations, the National Federation of Independent Business people, uh, Leona Consulting, um, Oregon Capital Watch, uh, Project Liberty. There are a lot of different groups, and I don't mean to offend anyone by omitting them, but a lot of groups have have liked what Western Liberty Network is doing, and they've been willing to co-sponsor some of our events. Excellent. If somebody wanted to get involved in Western Liberty Network, how could they do that? Well, they can uh, go to our website, westernlibertynetwork.org. Western Liberty Network is also on face page, and Kay over there does a very good job of keeping the face, the Western Liberty Network face page current, uh, Facebook page current. But uh, the Facebook page and, and the website provide all of the information you need. On the website in particular, you can download the training companion documents. You can see who all of the affiliates are. Uh, you can become an affiliate if you lead a grassroots organization. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff there, and uh, as far as current events and things that happen day to day, the Facebook page is really good for that. Okay, to get on there. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the goals of the organization moving forward? Is it just continuing this training? Because so far, you guys have been at it for a few years, mm -hmm. trained 250 people. And well, more than that. That's about about two hundred and fifty run have run for office, and two hundred got in. And and That's about incredible. two hundred got in. And what we do is we coach them. We say, look for an office that nobody's running for. You know, and there's find, a lot of them. And there's a lot of them. Yeah. And so I say, get the paperwork for four or five offices that you're eligible to run for. Fill them all out, and then go to the county office. You know, with ten minutes left to go before the deadline, see which ones nobody's filed for. Hand it over. Boom, you're elected. And uh, once you are elected, campaign as if you were not running unopposed. This gives you a chance to try campaigning. And if you make mistakes, it's okay. You'll win anyway. Uh, learn. Get people involved. Get a campaign manager. Get people to run a full-out campaign. But for those who don't run, we train them how to be campaign managers. We train them how to be campaign volunteers. And there are several thousand people who have had that training over the past four years. WLN is now, uh, in November, to be four years old. 
and uh, it's and and so right now it's about expanding the scope of people we're able to train and technology will be a part of that we're recording a lot of these trainings and we'll make those available online and push them out to email addresses that we have uh, but also it's about expanding into other states and other communities and doing what we can to make sure that people across America ultimately are able to take back responsibility of governing their local communities. You know, that Jeffersonian model of democracy where people at the local level show up at City Hall and solve problems together in cooperative fashion. Sure. And it, it, I'll, I'll explain why this is important to folks because it, it's not all that easy anymore because so much of the process has been co-opted by professional politicians and professional consultants. And a lot of people make their money doing this stuff and the rules become increasingly complicated over time to where it's really intimidating for the average person mm -hmm. who it's just been sitting on the couch, who's worried about the country, uh, said, okay, well, I've had enough. I can sit here and shake my fist at the TV or I can get off the couch and go run for something. You have to have some resources to do that. And uh, it's either in the form of, okay, I've got a million dollars in the bank, I'll you know, start a campaign, I'll hire a consultant, he'll spend those million dollars somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, they will. They, they will, but yeah. for the average guy, it, it's a minefield because you've got potential mm -hmm. uh, fines and violations and, and ethics things. But not for these local positions. I tell people all the time, I say, look, we are not going to save this country by winning the presidency and Congress and the governor's mansions. Those things will help, and we need to pay attention to those races. But where we're going to secure the future of our republic will be at the local level, where it doesn't require very much money to run. I spent zero on my last campaign. That's right. Your opponent spent money. My opponent spent $12,000. I spent zero. You know, he ran a negative campaign, and it backfired. Uh, but, you know... Even then, I, I've never spent more than $1,000 on any of the races I've ever run and won. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of money. And I tell these people, I say, look, these are the local positions that are going to determine the foundation of the future governance of our country. But these are the races you can win. These are the races you can win if you're not a professional speaker. You can win if you're not an expert on fire safety or water safety or education. You can win it if you don't have a million dollars. These are the ones where you can win. And so the future of this country is still up to you. Don't let them tell you that you have no power. We are all out of time. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this is Oregon Voters Digest. For more information, you can go to www.oregonvoterdigest.com or westernlibertynetwork.org. Thank you, Scott.